Good morning, good morning. Um, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and I am the moderator of this keynote fireside chat. And uh, I don't know what happened to our guest. I mean, if you think this is a skit and we planned this, uh, you'd be wrong. Oh, there he is. <laughs> this is Amit Singh Hall from Google. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Rubin. I've been working on my tan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to introduce Amit, he is the Senior Vice President of Search at Google uh, and also a Google Fellow, which uh, maybe you can just start off by explaining what exactly that means. Ah, a Google Fellow. Uh, jokingly, I often say, when you get promoted to your level of incompetence, you become a Google fellow. <laughs> but the truth is that uh, we have a technical ladder in which you don't have to manage large groups and actually achieve the highest ranks in the company. And uh, the highest rung on the technical ladder is a Google fellow. And uh, that's what I am. OK. And, and wearing your search hat, does this mean you run all of search for Google? Yeah, wearing my SVP title, yes, I get to run all of search. It's a pleasure. So Matt Cutts works for you? Uh, Matt Cutts and I have been working together for a long time. And uh, yes, I work for Matt Cutts, but he reports to me. Uh, how many of you heard of Matt Cutts? It's all the C SEO people, right? So you're all the people who are like behind Matt Cutts' house, digging through his trash to look for that algorithm that y you need, right? And okay. we have taught him to shred everything. <laughs> so, uh, first, just to s establish sort of a base, can you explain the basic gist, the basic algorithm of Google search for the people who are not familiar? I mean, we all hear the story about, you know, you count inbound links, but what is it today? So, uh, let me first take a step back uh, and kind of tell you how we think about search, what our aspirations okay. are, and then I'll talk about how search works uh, today. Uh, at Google, we believe that a perfect search engine should know exactly what you mean and give you exactly what you want. And now to build that perfect search engine, we have to be comprehensive, relevant, and fast. Now, search engines today go out and crawl everything that they can find, that is following links on the web, fetching pages, fetching videos, you name it. And then we index them, building an index pretty much like an index at the back of a book. And then we run our ranking algorithms given your query, which documents are the most salient, most relevant uh, to that query. And that's how you see Google's top search result page rendered with lots of algorithms going behind it. So inbound links is clearly one of the important signals. But we used over 200 search, such signals uh, to build the perfect search engine that we want to build. And you know. Uh, our dream is for search to become the Star Trek computer, and, and that's what we are building today. And can you tell us, okay, so we know links is one. What are the other 199? I'm just the gist of it. <laughs> Let's see. If I start counting, Guy, you won't be able to ask me another question. <laughs> uh, but you can imagine the obvious ones are, you know, what words are in your title, what is the content on the page, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we use numerous signals uh, to make sure that you get the most relevant results that Google gives you. To, to give us some idea of the complexity of this, um, how many lines of code is in this search algorithm of yours? Many. Well, <laughs> can you be a little more specific than that? More than I can read or write today. <laughs> How about a number? A big number. <laughs> OK, you're going to, you know, Twitter's going to lynch you for not answering. <laughs> uh, arguably, being in your position, you probably know better than anybody maybe what's on the internet so can you tell us what's on the internet is it a billion facebook pages and what else i mean is it tumblr is it google plus I and mean, what is it on the internet today so uh the world wide web which is what most people experience the internet as uh is the biggest repository of human knowledge ever put together it's just a wonderful thing for this world at last count we had seen over 30 trillion 
web addresses, web, uh, you, uh, not unique URLs, but 30 trillion web addresses uh, in over 250 million domains. So pretty much everything's on the internet. Okay, that's how, that's how we see it. Can you characterize that into some, you know, can you categorize that so we have, a, we have a sense of how much is social media versus how much is corporate websites versus how much is blogs versus... So I think uh, it's kind of hard for me to divide it uh, because some of the things on the web are not fully accessible to crawlers. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, all parts of the web are growing. Uh, and they're growing at an amazing pace, including social media and other web content. Okay. So you, you've been in this position and studying or doing search for decades now. Uh, with a sort of retrospective view, how has people's search evolved? I mean, so <clears throat> I've been working in the field of search for about 20 years. I started out as a grad student in 1990, and I've had that joyous journey where I get to do every day the first academic field that I fell in love with, that was search. And early on, uh, people who just were amazed if search at all worked. You remember those days when Google came around, and you're like, wow, this really works. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very enchanting moment. The first time I saw this white page with only a box you could put in text, and you, you know, of course, I searched for my name. That's the first search I ever did, right? And I was just, just enchanted from the very first moment I used Google. Uh, so, and, and what was the second search that you did? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, so Macintosh. Uh, <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> right. Um, and so when I started out at Google uh, 12 years back, already people were wowed by Google, but still, in the early days, people didn't fully expect search to work, and they were amazed when it did. In the last 12 years that I've been there, 14, 15 years of Google, people have completely come to expect search engines to work. And the questions that they have been asking have been getting harder and harder uh, because they expect it to work. And, and it's, it's truly uh, the joy that as we improve search that we have done quarter after quarter, year after year, the questions that we get from users have gotten harder. Well, what is an example of a hard question for Google to find? Well, people ask us all kinds of questions, uh, ones that would improve their lives, like, you know, I have pain in my knee, okay? Uh, what could I have? That's an example of something that will improve their lives. Uh, they, they ask about all serious issues uh, that they are facing in their lives. Um, and then we get some questions like, does my hair make me look bad? <laughs> um, what has been the effect of mobile devices on people's search? Mobile devices uh, have just revolutionized search. Uh, I was at Google uh, early days, and we saw our search growing exponentially. And when mobile devices came along, it was like you know me seeing my second child grow at the same pace even faster. Uh, so people are searching uh, on mobile uh, all the time, what we have observed is that during lunch hours and dinner hours, when desktop search goes down, a mobile search starts picking up. So people are actually searching all the time. And when we think of mobile, we look at it with a much wider lens than just thinking about your mobile phone. We think of the, we think of the context that you may be in. For example, Sometimes you can talk to your computer or your phone. Other times you can't. Like people sitting in the audience right now, if you start talking to your phone right now, the person sitting next to you would think you're crazy, and they would be right. Uh, sometimes you can look at things, and sometimes you can't. For example, when you're driving, you really don't have your eyes available to search. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can touch screens or do other gestures, and sometimes you can't. So, we are designing search for the future where it is everywhere. You can use it in any modality, any context that you are in, and it just fades in the background to answer whatever you need to know. Okay. And, and how is something like Google Plus and social, social search impact, impacting search? 
Guy, you wrote a book on Google Plus, well, buddy. You should uh, know. You know. I'm giving you softballs right now. I'm warming <laughs> you up right now. So uh, Google Plus is, is the identity platform that Google has that works across all products. Uh, uh, clearly, to make search truly universal, not only do we have to find you information and knowledge that's out there on the open web, a large amount of information and knowledge that you need is only accessible to you or, say, you and your family. Uh, things like pictures you may have shared with just your family or emails that you may have exchanged. So Google Plus allows us to make search truly universal by bringing that part of your web into search. OK. Uh, I have to ask you some tactical questions because well, I'm curious, actually. So how does a person or a company improve search results? How do I get on that first page of Google search results? <laughs> uh, the, the very important SEO question. Yes. So we at Google have time and time again said and seen it happen that if you build high quality content that adds value, and your users, your readers seek you out, as, as you know well, then really uh, you don't need to worry about anything else. You build high quality content that is adding value on top of what's already there, and people want that content, then your site would automatically work. When it comes to companies, if they build fast websites that caters to their users' needs, then really, uh, they can make a bunch of SEO mistakes. It wouldn't hurt them. So overall, it's all about high quality content and catering to your audience in a speedy website. So are you saying that SEO is bullshit? Uh, no, like, <laughs> guy, that would be like saying marketing is bullshit. Well, okay? it is bullshit. So. Oh. <laughs> I mean, if anybody can answer that question, I can. So, <laughs> so you should think of SEO, uh, good SEO as marketing to the web search engine. Right? It's basically telling website owners what to do and what not to do so that search engines can actually index your site. Right? You know, if your title says, welcome, add your title here, that's a bad title. Okay? <laughs> and SEO would tell you that you should have meaningful titles. You shouldn't use all flash content because search engines can't really parse that. And there's a lot of value that SEO adds to content because it's marketing that content to a search engine, which is an important aspect of this ecosystem. OK. So this is my last question at this tactical level. So um, have you, let's, uh, so you and Matt Cutts, you're sitting in your cubes, right? And have you ever been in a situation where you read some SEO experts blog and you said to Matt, oh my god, this guy figured out our algorithm. We have to change it. Ah, more often than not, guy. I read something and I'm thinking, I don't believe people believe that. <laughs> so that would be a no then? Yeah, that would be a no. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, now switching gears again, uh, let's talk about not just mobile, but voice. How does voice change search? Um, so human beings uh, are actually very natural, naturally interacting with voice, right? We have all seen that cartoon where we evolved to stand up and then sat down at our computer again. And I believe that the second wave of that cartoons coming where people are standing back again because they can use a mobile phone or other devices and they don't have to be chained to a computer at their desk. And obviously, when you are using a form factor that's very small, uh, voice is a far more natural interface uh, than typing. But at times, there are many other interfaces that you have to use when you can't use voice, uh, like people in the audience can't. You still have to have other modalities to interact with it. But voice clearly is a critical component of interacting with search in the future. OK. Uh, for this kind of audience, you know, what, knowing what you know and, and with your two decades of search experience, what should they do going forward? Let's say these, these people are entrepreneurs, they own companies, they're bloggers, and obviously they want to be found. So what, and I know you already said, you know, basically write good shit, but how, 
is there any other action that they could take and go forward and, you know, have it in the back of their mind when they're writing and designing websites? You know, this is what I have to do. This is, this is the sweet spot. So, you know, I, I'd let you in on a secret, right? You know, future of search would be bringing knowledge to the world in a completely multimodal environment. So imagine Star Trek computer, okay? Imagine you can talk to it, you can touch it, you can type into it, and many other modalities. Now, in that computer, uh, content would be critical for the success of building that Star Trek computer. So having all of humanity's knowledge online on the web is not enough. You need to understand that knowledge, which is, you know, we understand uh, the sentences, for example, written on a web page so that we can parse it. And I think going forward, the entire ecosystem would evolve uh, to actually support that type of search, that future Star Trek computer, uh, because that's what users want. And, and in this world, um, Do people, I mean, is it, is it truly as simple as taking what you said and sort of just going off and trying to create knowledge and find knowledge and filter knowledge? Uh, is, is it like this romantic notion? Is that, I mean, are we supposed to buy that, that that's the way to do this? Well, absolutely. What other ways? Absolutely. What other way is there, right? You know, going forward, we collectively, as the web community, are working for our users, which is the entire humanity. Uh, and we need to improve their lives. Otherwise, you know, uh, why are we here? Why are we doing this? So I'll tell you stories that, that I have encountered, uh, which makes me come to work every morning jumping up and down. Uh, I met a farmer once from Africa, and he was pained by ants on his potato crops. His potato crop was the only way he made living for his family. And ants invaded his potato crops one day. He went to the local internet kiosk, and on Google searched for ants on potato crops or some such, and learned that he could just spray ash from his uh, home oven on his potato crop, crops and ants would go away. Well, guess what? He had a bumper potato season. His family's lives were improved. You know why? Because someone like you out there wrote that knowledge down and put it on the World Wide Web. And someone like me was able to rank it and search it properly and bring it to that farmer. So, we should not forget what we are doing together. We are in this business to improve people's lives, all of humanity's lives. Wow, you're making me cry. I mean, I mean. <laughs> That's a tough one to make guy cry. <laughs> um, can you talk about this new thing, Google Now? Like, what's the vision? What's, what are you trying to accomplish there? So if you think of search uh, as that future Star Trek computer, uh, which is like a perfect assistant by your side whenever you need it. Uh, you can talk to it, ask it things, but then it should be able to tell you things when you need to know without even asking it. For example, if your flight is delayed, then you shouldn't be asking, what is the status of my flight? You should just know that your flight is delayed. Or if your meeting is an hour away and there's bad traffic, then Google should just tell you, well, you better leave now because you'll be stuck in traffic. That's our vision of Google now, where things that you absolutely need to know just come to you. And, and, and we are very excited about the early success of Google now. We are learning a lot as people are using it, and, and the future is looking even better than that. Okay. Uh, let's talk about privacy. So, you know, arguably Google knows more about everybody in the world than anybody else or anything else. So, w what is the philosophy of privacy for Google? So, we at Google take privacy very seriously. All of us, uh, uh, 
the management team, all the engineers, we are private citizens with private lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we care about our privacy and our users' privacy uh, tremendously. Uh, and therefore, we have built the most secure systems to store uh, all the data that we have. Uh, it's about security of that data, and Google is far ahead in this game, as you may have been reading about various things that have been happening in the press with respect to hacking and so on and so forth. Google's systems are so secure to protect your data that I feel very good about uh, how deeply we care about our users' privacy and how we have put all the security systems in place to ensure it remains private. And, and can you just... Um can you just tell us some dark stories about how people try to break in and I mean so I'm not an expert in security, but you have been reading in the New York Times how people uh, from the other side of the world have tried hacking into various companies and how Google has been uh, tremendously successful in fending off those attacks because of our uh, the best in class security systems that are out there okay uh, Let's talk on a more personal level. So you've been at Google for 12 years now? Indeed. And you've been in search for 20 years now? Absolutely. Uh, for a young audience, can you give them some career advice? I mean, now that you are where you are, you're you know, one level, you're, you're at the second highest level of Google, right? Uh, <laughs> OK, so how about some career advice for someone who's clearly made it in technology? Looking back, uh, academics, first jobs, experiences, what should they do? So. There's only one career advice that I always give people, including my kids. Uh, we have two kids, 16 and 12. Uh, the 16-year-old is in high school, uh, applying for colleges soon. And there's only one career advice I give her and everyone else. Follow your heart and do what it says. Because if you do, you will sleep happy and that happiness is worth much more than any amount of money you can make. And I can look back at my career and say things that were not logical to do. Uh, I I'm a first generation immigrant in this country. I came here in 1990 and got a master's in computer science. I was working in a job and for those of you like me, who are first generation immigrants know that immigration is important, getting a green card is important so that you can make your life here. And I was working in a company and I applied to Cornell for a PhD and most people gave me advice that you should keep working and get your green card so that you can do whatever you want to do later and don't quit your job to go to grad school and make $800 a month as stipend, okay? But my heart said, I wanted to do this. I want to get a PhD in search. Yes, there's such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I want to do a PhD in search, so I'm going to go do a PhD in search. I was married. My wife and I, were, it was the two of us with no support from financial support from family as a first generation immigrant, as numerous stories you have heard. And we ended up in Cornell with like, you know, $1,200 a month in my graduate student stipend. And I loved every moment of it every moment of it and and here i am some 20 years later sitting in front of you because i loved it and that's what it's all about and and what did your parents say when you said you want to keep going to school uh, <laughs> my my parents have been tremendously supportive uh, all their lives of everything that we have done and they basically said son i don't understand that world that's my that's what my father said do what your heart says. When your parents meet with their friends and they say, you know, how's Amit doing? What does he do? What do they say? <laughs> uh, they, they are humble people. Uh, <laughs> they say, they basically end up saying, you know, uh, they are very happy. They have two kids. He's been happily married for a long time. And yes, thank you. Professionally, he's doing fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, for, for people who are trying to build companies in this audience, being that you've been inside of one of the great successes. Can you extrapolate or you know, synthesize for us some lessons that Google offers entrepreneurs? So uh, early days of Google, I'll tell you a story. Um, one company came and, and told Google, uh, 
that if you place banner ads on your home page, we would give you so many million dollars. Of course, that would have turned that startup from a money-losing startup to a money-making startup. And Larry Page asked his team, is this good for our users? And of course, everyone said, no, we don't want those dancing monkey ads. <laughs> um, uh, it's not good for our users. The ads are not relevant, and it will slow down our page load times. Then Larry said, why are we doing this? Now, I'm telling you that story because there was a belief in Larry Page. Larry and Sergey have always believed that users come first. We need to give them our services at an amazing speed. Speed is still the killer app. And nothing should compromise user experience. Now, that belief is what helped Google in times when it could have made wrong decisions. Because as an executive, as an entrepreneur, as a startup CEO, when you're making decisions, there's no right or wrong. You have to have some beliefs, because you can't analyze everything to death. The data does not exist. So if you go with your beliefs, you would make things successful. As they say, there is no right decision. You make your decision right. Any and that's, that comes from your beliefs. That comes from inside. OK, so that's one big lesson. Any more big lessons from, from Google's history here? Well, uh, it, it comes back to, right, you know, uh, care about your users, do the right thing. And, you know, uh, you will sleep happy and succeed while doing that. OK, OK. Uh, as you look back on your career, did you make any mistakes? Any mistakes that would help people here avoid mistakes? So, well, if you look back, and you think about your mistakes, then you won't be happy about it. So one principle that I learned early on in life, very early on, uh, is make a decision, never look back. Never, ever, ever look back. So if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it the same way, and I'd make the same mistakes that I, I, I may have made. But again, if, you, if I didn't make those mistakes, I wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be here. Okay. So I don't harp upon the past. I look at uh, my life and say, I do it all over again exactly the same way, including the mistakes that I, I, I may have made, because never look back. Well, just move forward. Can you just give us a few of the mistakes that you made that you don't regret making? Because I'm fascinated. <laughs> So uh, the mistake that I made was Google approached me like a year and a half earlier than I joined. Yeah. And I said, no, go away. I work for AT&T, the big company, <laughs> which is there forever. And, and that cost you how many billions? Uh, just, you know, it, as I say, I never look back. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for not looking back on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, you're being interviewed by the guy who left Apple twice. So what can I say? Um, <laughs> One more, one more entrepreneurial question. If knowing what you know now, seeing the landscape of what's happening, if you were starting a business, what kind of business would it be? <laughs> um, well, I'll be working at Google because that's what I'm doing. I love doing that because mm -hmm. there is no more, in my view, in the field of computing, there is no problem as interesting and as impactful for the world as making the entire world knowledgeable. So any business that can help that endeavor, I would be starting. And, and I'm doing those things inside Google uh, by building the next set of projects and products uh, that would allow us to uh, complete our mission. Can you give us a little hint about you know, what the next set of projects and things are without getting fired <laughs> today? Uh, no, well, you know, we, we have this joke in Google, right? When someone joins my team, we take them out drinking and we feed them four drinks. Uh, if they start talking about their past projects, we fire them. <laughs> and they gave me the eight drink test. I passed. <laughs> 
of now t talk about the responsibility that comes with something like this I mean in a sense if all this information is out there but you're the filter and the curator and the portal to all this information what comes with that what kind of responsibility comes with that indeed indeed a, a, a very good question guy and, and I, I I kind of at times feel feel the same uh, question, ask myself that question inside being Google, right? You know, our responsibility is to all our users in the world to give them uh, the best information that we can. And the way I deal with, with that responsibility and my team deals with that responsibility is kind of bringing that responsibility down to a science. Okay. So we have developed the science of how you take an idea into a product and how do you evaluate it scientifically every step of the way. We have put out numerous videos and blog posts kind of demystifying that science that you can read out there. And at the end of the day, I deal with this responsibility with one thought. We did the best science could to help our users. And yes, we could do a whole lot better. That's why I go in the next day and my mm -hmm. team comes in the next day and thinks of new ideas to do things better. But we have kind of, we fall back on science because we are all scientists. We have large numbers of PhDs in my team uh, and we are just all scientists. We approach it very scientifically, measure everything we do and remember that we are doing it for our users. So if, the, if there's user benefit, we will do it. Otherwise, we won't. Uh, but th that seems like it's a one or a zero, you know, users benefit or not. I mean, obviously, there's a spectrum, and some do and some don't. And how do you make that call? It's well, not like everybody's going to benefit or no one's going to benefit, right? So, so uh, once again, right, you know, we fall back upon science. Any change in search that you make, uh, you improve many queries, and you may hurt a few queries. Okay, and at the end of the day, we fall back on statistics. You know, if we improve 60% of the queries. If we improve 60% of the queries that this algorithm is impacting, and 20% don't remain, uh, remain unchanged, and 20% are mildly worse, then that's, in all, it's a good thing for our users, and we will launch it. And you can see uh, videos of that launch meeting where we decide how to launch something, and there's a healthy debate on why something should or should not be done. Okay. Um, let's talk about Facebook for a second. So. Facebook search. What do you think? I mean, is it? Well, I think time will tell if people really need that kind of search or if people are using it. Uh, they're starting uh, from where they could have started. But, you know, we'll see if people need that kind of search. Yeah. I, it's going to be a long time before I go to Facebook to search for anything that, you know, I'm trying to depend on. Thank um, you for being a loyal customer. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about Google and developing markets? What, what is, what's your responsibility there? Do you do things differently for them? I mean, I, you told this great story about the farmer in Africa you know, fixing his potatoes. Uh, what is Google's um, approach there? So look, I was born and raised in India. It's still a developing country. And, and I feel deep responsibility not towards not only towards India, but all developing mm -hmm. uh, countries, because people there need a lot more information. We in the Western world are spoiled. We understand English, and majority of the web is in English, or a large proportion of the web. People in the developing countries uh, can't even access the web, and once they access the web, there is no information in their native language so that they can benefit from it. So we invest heavily in tools like Translate. Google Translate is the best translation system uh, in the world out there, so that people in India and in Indonesia and in Malaysia and in other countries can actually access the entire higher web, not just the tiny slice of web that's available in their native language. On top of that, we build our infrastructure so that people around the world can get to our data centers faster. Latency is a big problem in developing countries because the infrastructure is not developed as yeah, Latency is a problem in Northern California sometimes, uh, too. So. Uh, that is true, just because we are sucking it all up. Uh, <laughs> but in developing countries, people 
can't get to the nodes that they need to get to on the internet. And we bring satellite data centers and a lot of deep infrastructure so that everyone has access to Google and can actually read the entire web, not just the tiny slides of web in their language. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Google Glass. I mean, I realize that's not your product, but how does that impact search? Uh, once again, right, you know, if you look at search in the broader sense, right, there's cell phone, there's glass, there are many other devices that are coming out. Uh, I'm very excited about the future devices. And guess what? On every device, you would need to what search. You know, you need to find information or you need to know things. And, and Google Glass and several other devices that are coming out are, are, are really exciting as a search researcher because you get to think about, hmm, that gives me another context, another modality to deal with. How am I going to build a user experience on this device? And, and it's not only cell phones or glass or watches or whatever else is coming out. Uh, we have to think about how am I going to build search for everything out there and how people will interact with it. So from my perspective, these are some of the best times in search. Not only are all the technologies coming together, speech recognition, knowledge craft, natural language understanding, there are numerous devices coming out. So when you marry all this, tomorrow is looking bright. <laughs> Somebody just flat. I'm looking, I'm reading this tweet here. How do we ask about it? So, Erica is asking this question, which I thought we answered, but let's ask it again. She's asking, how is Google Search changing in the future? So how will you change Google Search? I think we already answered it, right? You know, the destiny of Search is to become that Star Trek computer, and that's what we're building. Uh, what does become their Star Trek computer mean? Because basically, it's some just of these people are so young, they may not watch Star Trek. So. <laughs> Good point, good point. <laughs> you know, I, I always forget at my age, everything starts yeah, I, blurring. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had uh, drinks with Stephen Wolfram and his son last night, and he was telling me the I story. I thought Stephen didn't drink. Well, he drank, actually, he drank orange juice mixed with Sprite, just so you know. Score. Uh, yeah, so if you want to be a mathematician, orange juice and Sprite. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about this instance where uh, Mathematica was going to create this poster, and they wanted to have a poster to send to all these colleges. And he said that it started off, they wanted to build a poster, and they got this Russian mathematician involved, and it became like 60 feet long because he wanted to put so much stuff in it. And, and so I said, oh, so I said to his son, well, that, that would be for a mathematician what the Farrah Fawcett poster was to many teenage boys. <laughs> And he looked at me like I was nuts, and I said, do you know who Farrah Fawcett is? And he said, no, I'd never. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so for, for, for those of you who have never watched an episode of Star Trek, number one, please go do that, because <laughs> next time I see you, if you tell me you haven't watched Star Trek, I will walk away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> number two, in Star Trek, right, there's this... Starship computer. And, you know, the captain walks up to the computer and says, Computer, what is the atmosphere down there on that planet? And I was raised with this stuff. I was raised in the 70s as a little boy in India on our black and white TV watching reruns of Star Trek uh, with uh, uh, Captain Kirk and uh, his, his crew. And that fascinated me. I'm like, I want to fly around galaxies and talk to a computer. The flying around the galaxies part, Elon Musk is working on. <laughs> Not I'm, if you believe the New York Times, but that's... <laughs> and, uh, and the talking to a computer part, I'm working on, okay? So between the two of us, we'll build you Star Trek, okay? So you can walk up to your computer and say, hey, computer. All right. So... Uh, Guilt UX wants to know, other than search, what are you interested in? I'm very interested in devices uh, because it poses... You can come work for Motorola. 
<laughs> uh, well, Motorola, Motorola is a is a great part of Google, and thank you for uh, being a consultant. That's there. Okay. Anyway, so what else besides search uh, devices? Devices, devices, because it kind of poses unique challenges for a researcher, for a search researcher, for a knowledge researcher. I'm very interested in networking because more often than not, I find that networks fail me. I have the device, I have all the computing in my pocket, but there is no network for me to connect to the cloud. And without the thousands and hundreds of thousands or millions of computers in the cloud, I kind of don't have the power I need. So, you know, these are kind of, this is the spectrum of, of what I'm interested in, right? From networking to devices, and of course, they search somewhere there. We should move to Kansas City. No? Anybody from Kansas City here? Yes. So is it really as good as they say? Yeah? I, I'm not talking about the ribs. I'm talking about you know, internet access. So it's good? Can you do that in Northern California? Like, you live in Palo Alto, right? Yes, So indeed. just do from Palo Alto, Menlo Park, and Atherton. That's all I ask. <laughs> uh, well, how about we don't do Atherton where you live and everywhere else? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk to Larry about that. <laughs> um, uh, another great question here. So how will Google deal with this, the new sensors technology, the new sensors in everything? So when now you're really you're getting raw data. It's not even you know, people's interpretation of information and composition. It's data. So how does Google deal with that? So our task at Google has always been taking data, be it billions of pages on the web and billions and billions of links, be it almost 600 million entities in our knowledge graph and over three and a half billion facts there. It's all data. We take that data and we convert it into useful information to make you knowledgeable. Now, take a simple uh, point, data point, which is your mobile phone has GPS in it. And if you are opted into Google Now, then that GPS can figure out where your home is or mm -hmm. where your office is, and we'll give you traffic to home, office, your next meeting. That's a simple example of taking, taking numerous data points and converting it into a very useful service for you. And that's how Google thinks about all data. Our job is to move higher in what's known academically as the DIKW pyramid, Data gets converted into information, which brings you wisdom, knowledge, and then arrives wisdom. So we are clearly moving towards the knowledge part of that pyramid. Okay, okay. Uh, Megan McCook has a very practical question here. She's asking, as geolocation plays a bigger part in mobile search results, how important is it for a business to create and claim their Google Plus local pages? So Google Plus local is really good for businesses because it allows you to have a new way for your customers to reach you and present yourself to your customers in a new way. Google Plus is a rich environment, as you know, with, with uh, uh, your customers being there, and you can put all kinds of information there. And uh, obviously, if you have that page, then that can appear in Google through Google Local, uh, and, and that's really beneficial to both your customers and to you as a business. Okay. I love the, this is great questions. So what is your favorite app that utilizes search? Well, I'm not biased at all, but the Google search app is my favorite oh, app. Oh, come on. I mean, that's a chicken shit answer. I mean. <laughs> well, if you don't okay, have it, Okay, what's your guy, second favorite? If you don't have it, guy, you should download it on your iPhone, <laughs> right? You know, it's basically, and then compare it to the other app side by side. Yeah. Why not? I use an Android phone. I don't oh, great. I'm proud of you. Yeah, you know, real men use Android. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm, not, okay. I'm not going there. <laughs> so what is your second favorite app that utilizes search? OK, uh, what is your non-Google app, your favorite non-Google app that utilizes search? 
Huh. I wear a Fitbit. I like the Fitbit app. Fitbit? Yes. Yeah. Um, because you know, then I, you know, I don't know how much what you characterize as search, but you know, I have my Fitbit app. I love it because I wear a Fitbit. I measure my steps, um, and you know, all kinds of sensory technology. I'm really, ex so really you, excited about. So you're it. telling me at the end of the day, you know, you and Matt, you look at your Fitbit and you say, Matt, we got to go out there and do some steps because we're only at ten thousand and we want to be at twenty thousand. Matt is crazy. He always be it's me every day. We are Fitbit buddies, and, and Fit he's yes, yes, absolutely. You can be buddies on Fitbit, and 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 he kicks. You guys are a little too close. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, question here: Search has revolutionized the way we learn. What does your university of the future look like? Education. Ah, that's a whole new area. That's a whole different subject, right? You know, I've I've heard. So many wonderful talks about 13-year-old hacking their uh, education right now. Uh, clearly, uh, the current educational model has to evolve. Okay, like everything else, it will evolve, and search and the World Wide Web will play a huge role in it. Not only through technologies like Udacity or various other uh, university uh, universities online courses that you see. People will just expect to have simple answers at their fingertip. I believe search will do to education what calculators did to math education early on. You don't have to remember simple things. You can actually learn as opposed to memorizing simple facts because search will take care of the mundane. <laughs> this is a funny question. All right. Uh, when you, when you, Amit, when you do a search, how do you phrase the search terms? <laughs> as naturally as they come to me. Oh, come on, Amit. Uh, and if it doesn't work, someone in my team gets yelled at. How about that? <laughs> uh, uh, let me ask a, okay, so how, how often do you put quotation marks over things, uh, around al things? Almost never, because it almost should just never? work. Yeah. Really? It, it should just work. Of course, quotation marks are a great tool when you're trying to be very specific and find that exact sentence on the web. But I seldom do that. I just kind of search as it comes to me naturally, right? You know, I, I basically ask Google, for example, hey, Google, will it rain tomorrow? And it works. I ask Google, uh, how tall is Barack Obama? It works. Then I can ask Google, who's he married to? And it works because we understand that he's referring to Barack Obama. Okay. Okay. And and how about you know, you 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 type in Kawasaki. Do you put minus motorcycle if you only want to find stuff about me? Or no, I you... usually add guy because you are the only Kawasaki I'm ever looking for. <laughs> can I quote what you? What else that? is there? <laughs> um, Good question here from C.J. Dahlberger. What is the biggest challenge to accomplishing Google's mission? Well, there are several key technologies that still are not solved. We at Google have made huge strides in them, but they are not solved problems. Knowledge graph, speech recognition, natural language understanding, and conversation. These are the four big challenges that we are working on. Knowledge Craft lets you understand the world as you and I, human beings, do. Speech recognition lets you understand voice as you and I, we human beings, do. Natural language understanding allows us to convert that voices, voice transcription into something that we can understand, and then you have to match it all together to do the search magic that we do every day. Uh, none of these are solved problems. And guess what, 20 years back, when I started out as a grad student, I never thought they would be as far ahead as they are today in my lifetime. So, so you th you think I'm we've very proud. We've progressed faster than you thought? Absolutely, absolutely. 20 years back, when we were starting out, uh, I was starting out as a grad student in search. We were struggling to figure out that Apple is a company and apples is fruit. Today, we have come far ahead. Today, if you type church address as a query into Google. Google understands that you're looking for speech, church speech, okay? As opposed to if you type, uh, you know, uh, feed burner address, Google understands that you're looking for feed burner URL, okay? This is the level of understanding that we have already brought in with Knowledge Graph. We have taken it to the next level. So when I started out, 
I didn't see that in my lifetime we'll be this far ahead. I'm very proud that we are here, but that makes me even more hungry. Okay, okay. Um, Ritu Rao has a question probably we touched on already, but I, I think many people would like to know this. So how can small businesses stand out in search with limited resources? I think we already touched upon this, yeah. right? Work for your customers, do the right thing for your customers, and that's, that's the way to stand out. People build businesses, and no business is built overnight. And you shouldn't expect your business to be huge overnight. Just, you know, you, you acquire customers by working for them for years. Okay. Another question from the audience about uh, the future of search in regards to healthcare and wellness. Uh -huh. This is clearly... Oh, you have a Fitbit, so... So, you know, let's start with the Fitbit. <laughs> uh, but, but genuinely, this is a very important question. We, we think about it all the time because uh, we, we don't have a perfect healthcare system. <laughs> really? That's an understatement. You should laugh now. <laughs> <laughs> but that system for third world countries, for peer, poor people, is even worse. So, we think about when our mission is to improve people's lives via knowledge, uh, how are you going to improve people's lives when they really need to know about health information? And, and we, we care about it deeply. We are looking at various ways to change your experience. Uh, none I can talk about uh, right now. But the very first one is to make sure that you get reliable, high-quality information when you search for health information because more than any other area, it matters so much more there. Okay. Um, some tactical things. You know, if, if people see search results that are wrong, clearly wrong, not, not debatable, you know, gun control pro or con, but clearly factual wrong in a Google search, is there a mechanism where they can tell Google, you know, let me tell you, this is wrong, I'm going to help... Out of the goodness of their heart, they want to improve the result. Yep. What could Trixie or Biff do to, well, how do they send an email to you? I mean, what, how do they do that? So there's a feedback link at the bottom of every search result page, okay. which says give us feedback. Okay. And you can click on that, and it would allow you to take a screenshot and so on, and you can actually send us feedback on what's so totally wrong. And people read that user feedback, and, and I've gotten a tremendous value out of that feedback. So that's a great starting point. And if something's so badly broken, I'm sure you can find uh, uh, other ways of sending Matt or me mail. So you're telling me that humans get that, and they look at it, and they say, this is broken, we need to fix well, they at least bring it to us uh, so that we can figure out uh, if we can improve our algorithms to fix things. So one thing that we don't do at Google is we don't manually fix search results. There are well-defined policies on when we would manually intervene. For example, uh, when someone is violating our written web spam guidelines, then we will manually in intervene. Or say, when our uh, filters fail to detect something as pornographic, we would say, oh, our filters failed, but this is indeed not what users would want. So we manually tag as pornography. And in case of uh, legal things, we, we manually intervene. But other than that, our first attack on the problem is to look at all the reports and come up with new algorithms to fix a report, because every broken query is a huge improvement waiting to happen. OK. Uh, question from Anderson. Anders 900, um, how will search in Google Maps on mobile evolve? Well, clearly, Maps is a critical aspect of your mobile experience mm -hmm. because geography matters so much well, more when you're out Just ask any about. iPhone user, yeah, okay. So yes, ple please be careful what you use. <laughs> so what, what, will, what will happen? What, what? Uh, I think you know it'll be it it'll be a critical component of the Star Trek computer we are building. You're really into Star Trek. Huh? I really am. You know, um, my team actually wants me to wear uh, Captain Kirk's uh, uniform and ask a question at <laughs> TGIF. <laughs> Have you ever met William Shatner? Uh, not yet, but I look forward to one day. Yeah. Uh, as long as he doesn't sell me hotel rooms. <laughs> 
Uh, he, he is genuinely a funny person. I, 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 th- can I think believe he's that. gotten better and better with age. Uh, yeah, you know. Clearly, you know, I loved Boston Legal where he was Denny Crane. But a- even after Denny Crane, he's just... He, I, I, I kind of feel the same way. So I'm 58 years old, and I just... I really, I just care less about what people think now. And I think William Shatner is at that point. He really does not care at all. He just... <laughs> Let's it rip, and I love that. And 20 years from now, Guy, you will be as funny as he is. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there a point where the tech layer becomes too helpful to the point of curtailing offline social intellectual progress? <laughs> I didn't even know there was such a thing as offline intellectual progress. But uh, is there a point where this tech layer becomes too much? Uh, from my perspective, technology should just fade in the background so that you can go about doing what you love doing. You know, I love playing with my kids outside. I shouldn't be changed to a desk. Mobile phones have made it easier, but still they are unnatural. I have to pull them out of my pocket, unlock them and say something. Technology should just fade in the background so that it can give you what you need as you are doing what you love doing. And that's my dream one day where you know, I won't have to change my normal modality. I could be just walking my dog or doing whatever else I love doing, and still, the power of Google will be with me all the time. Okay. Uh, last question I'll take here is, how is Google reacting to the Bing search attack campaign? Uh, we focus on our users, and we are building the product that I love building. Um, Others should focus on building good products, too. (laughs) Oh, actually, this is a very interesting question. Let's add this one. So when will the search engine modify content for me? For example, if you did a search and it flags things that I am allergic to when I search for recipes. That's a great question and a great idea. Yeah, that is an interesting idea. So if, I, if I'm allergic to peanuts and I s- do a search and peanuts is in the recipe, Google should tell me, don't use this recipe. That's a great idea. And you know, I have a personal story here. Right? My daughter is severely allergic to all nuts, and we are struggling all the time uh, to find recipes that don't have any nuts. That's a great idea, dude. You know, whoever sent it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you know, this is uh, the tenth of. Is it the tenth or the ninth? I don't. Tenth. So it is uh, March tenth, and we're gonna see, you know, when I type in a recipe, I get a recipe, and it tells me I'm allergic to that. Don't use it. Let's. The clock is starting. So. Oh, no pressure. Just yeah. send a text message to Matt Cutts, and <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, how about I, I just give you this opportunity to summarize? We're just about out of time. So, summarize the. The future direction of Google search, uh, the future direction of the impact of mobile and devices. Uh, paint this picture of this future world of Google search uh, for us. So in the future, our dream is that you would walk around, and not only you, everyone in the world, connected to this biggest repository of human knowledge, all of humanity's knowledge that is present on the web, that even a farmer in Africa or a mother in an Indian village or a fisherman in Malaysia will have as much access to knowledge as kings used to. And even the kings didn't have last century. And what that would do is, that would allow them to improve their lives, their families' lives, their friends' lives, their communities' lives. And that's why we do what we do. Through technology, we want to change people's experience of their life so that they actually do what they love doing and take care of their loved ones. Technology is just the vehicle, it's just the means to an end, which is happiness in my view. Okay, so would you join me in thanking Amit Singha from Google? Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you.
Thank you.